evening. I'm going to ask you to step outside your comfort zone for a moment. I want you to read that word out loud as a group. What did that feel like? Did you notice that your stomach got a little tight? Maybe you felt tightness in your chest? Did the word get caught in your throat? Tonight, we're going to talk about something really difficult. We're going to talk about a crisis that, from the CDC's perspective, is actually considered to be one of the biggest concerns in the country right now. It's an epidemic. Suicide. In the past 10 years, suicide rates in the United States have gone up by as much as 60% in some states. In fact, suicides in the United States now account for more deaths than motor vehicle accidents. Think about that. More people die by suicide in the United States than die by motor vehicle accidents. In fact, in the next 15 minutes, by the end of my presentation, two people in the United States will have died by suicide. Those two people, if someone had intervened in that critical 15 minutes that, caused, that, that, that are a, 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 a suicide crisis, if somebody had intervened in that time when people are feeling lonely, when the person is feeling that they don't belong, that they have a desire to die, and that they don't have a fear to die. If somebody had intervened in that time, you might have, we might have been able to save those lives. Suicide is incredibly personal. It's personal to me. I would imagine that I'm not alone. When I look around this room, how many, how many people have been touched in some way by suicide, whether it's a family member, a friend, a colleague, somebody at work? Look around this room, the hands that are raised. Suicide really is a crisis, and we don't talk about it. So we're going to talk about it tonight. All right? I'm going to talk about it by sharing a story, share a little bit of my story. This is my brother, Kyle. I was five years old when Kyle was born, and I knew immediately, as much as a five-year-old can, that he was somebody special, that he was a unique soul. He understood rhythm in a way that nobody I've ever met did. By the time Kyle was four, he had his first drum kit. When he was seven, he started taking percussion lessons at Michigan State University. And by the time he was 10, he was really a very proficient musician. This is a picture of Kyle and me when I was a lot younger. <laughs> when I was a high school freshman, and Kyle was, um, I think, a fourth grader. So we grew up in a small town, and we played for several years together in bands. Kyle was, despite the difference in our years, he was the best drummer available. And I was really glad to have that kind of percussive force behind my music, even if it was my little brother, who's, you know, nine at the time. Wasn't really cool, but he was cool. When Kyle was 15, he had his first suicide attempt. It was in the summer, and I was home from college, and Kyle took a bottle from the medicine cabinet, ingested the whole bottle, and later in the evening, as he was falling asleep, he started to get sick. And so he went and he talked to my parents. He woke my parents up, and they took him to the emergency room. He was there for a few hours. They brought him back. And that was sort of it. We never talked about that attempt. And in fact, when I look back on that, I realized that there were three people in my high school class that before graduation died by suicide. The community didn't talk about that. If you live in a small town the size of Deerfield, and three people were murdered before they graduated from high school, 
What do you think the response would be? Probably not the silence that comes from suicide. When, in hindsight, I think about the situation with my brother and, and that suicide attempt, I think about my parents' experience. And what I realize is that my parents thought that this was just adolescent angst, maybe gone a little too far. That, in fact, Kyle was just being a teenager, right? Um, but I was really worried. I, I spent the next week sleeping on the floor next to his bed because I was so concerned about him. I was worried. But I didn't know what to say. That's important. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know whether to talk to him about his suicide attempt. And so I did what a lot of loved ones do. I turned and looked the other way. When Kyle was a junior in high school, he joined a rock band, that rock band. And he juggled for the next two years, his junior and senior years of high school, he juggled athletics, he juggled academics, and he was good at both. He juggled rehearsals and gigs, and his band was playing all over the Midwest. They were playing in venues and large concert halls. And by the time Kyle was a freshman in college, his band had gotten a recording contract and they moved to, they moved to Chicago. When Kyle moved to Chicago, when he got to Chicago, he became the kind of go-to studio drummer. And the more he played in the studio, the more attention he got. And you can see he kind of had this look about him. So people liked him for live performances as well. And so in the 28 years that Kyle lived in Chicago, he became a very well-known, very competent musician playing rock, playing jazz, playing country music, something he'd love to do. And at the end of his life, he was at the pinnacle of his, of his career. He was doing what he wanted to do and doing it well. In the 28 years between the time Kyle had his first suicide attempt and his final suicide attempt, he became increasingly good at knowing what he wanted to do to die by suicide. He knew what would work. He did things that were increasingly risky, things like jumping out of airplanes. So he started out jumping out of airplanes, then it was out of hot air balloons, and then it was off the wing of a biplane. Now, if you see somebody doing that who you know is suicidal, you might think about having a conversation with that person and just asking them, what's happening? I didn't ask my brother. I was worried, but I didn't ask him. I talked to friends, and I talked to colleagues, but I didn't talk to Kyle. Thomas Joyner is a psychologist and a suicide expert who does research in um, Florida. Joyner has really determined that there are unique qualities about people who both attempt and eventually die by suicide. There are characteristics that he talks about in his research because his father died by suicide as well. And he wanted to understand that. And what Joyner has kind of come up with is that people who are suicidal or who, are, who attempt suicide and die by suicide, initially and most importantly, they feel alone. They feel isolated, even if they're in a group of people, even if they're socially engaged, as my brother was, internally they feel alone, they feel empty. They also feel as if they are a burden on the other people. The third thing that they have is a desire to die and a fear or a lack of a fear of dying. 
And the lack of fear of dying is where practicing suicide comes into play. So that 28 years for Kyle, where he was trying different ways of dying by suicide, getting increasingly more lethal over time, that's kind of taking away that fear of suicide. Finally, that desire for suicide is where it all comes together into a suicidal event, and that's a recipe for that's, that's really dangerous, right? The last time I saw Kyle was in March of 2009. He came with his 13-year-old son to visit me here in Deerfield. Um, we went skiing. We played music for the first time together in 20 years, and also for the last time. Something was different about Kyle. I didn't know what it was, and I didn't ask him, but I knew something was different. When I dropped him off at the airport, I told him I loved him, and he told me he loved me. And that was the last time we had a conversation. Kyle died six months later by suicide. He left his son, he left his friends, his colleagues, he left his parents, he left his sister, and he left me. I started this presentation by saying that suicide is personal. For me, it's incredibly personal. I think of suicide every day. I'm aware of how suicide has affected me every day. I miss my brother. I miss his laugh. I miss his humor. This was a shot that was taken behind stage at a Broadway play that Kyle was playing in, and he was supposed to be on stage. The curtain didn't work, so rather than engage in all the drama that everybody was involved with, he took his clothes off and continued to play backstage. That was, Kyle's, that was kind of Kyle's humor. right? I miss, I miss Kyle. You know, when he left me, it left a big hole in my heart. And any death is difficult. In fact, six months after Kyle's death, my sister died of cancer. And that was incredibly, unspeakably hard. But there was something about Kyle's death that hit me like a ton of bricks. And part of that was because I'm supposed to know, I was supposed to know how to ask the questions for him. I was supposed to know what to ask. I'd never ask him about his suicidality. You know, I'm a clinical social worker. I can probably be traced back to Kyle's first suicide attempt. I've worked with hundreds of people who are suicidal over my 25 years practicing. I know the questions to ask. I ran a crisis team that covered five emergency rooms. So I know how to ask those questions, and I never ask Kyle. When I saw his behaviors change, I didn't ask him. When I saw him withdraw in that six months after he visited me and started to push me away, I got angry at him. Rather than ask him, what's happening? What about your isolation? What about your feelings of self-loathing? I didn't ask him. When, Kyle, when I found out that Kyle had driven four hours from Chicago to visit my sister in her hospital room in my parents' hometown, and he didn't visit my parents the month before he died, I just blew it off. I was angry at him for withdrawing and for pushing me away. You know, I think about conversations a lot. And since Kyle's death, when I have conversations with people who are experiencing difficulties in their life, stresses in their life, I ask them about suicide directly. I ask the question about suicide. You can too. It's important to know 
that if you are concerned about somebody, asking them about suicide isn't going to make them suicidal. Right? But for a group of people who are suicidal, if you ask them, it's going to open up an opportunity for them to talk about that. They're going to feel like suddenly someone is listening to them. Just saying the word suicide out loud and asking them, tell me about your thoughts of suicide. It wouldn't be surprising if you were feeling suicidal right now. Saying that word is incredibly important. It helps destigmatize the word and the experience and everything about suicide. Before I leave tonight, I want to give you one more piece of information, something that you can take with you. Talking non judgmentally about suicide with somebody who is suicidal will not make them more suicidal. Being brave enough to have a conversation shows that you care. It shows empathy and openness. It shows a willingness to address the fear and stigma associated with suicidality. Using the word suicide in a conversation makes it clear what the conversation is about. And it makes it more difficult for that person to deny what they are experiencing. Please talk about suicide. Speak of suicide. Doing so might actually help you save a life. Thank you.